Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I know it seems really warm in here, so we'll all just try to... I don't know what. How do we do... How do we make it cooler in here? I don't know. Uh, anyway, I won't be offended if anyone gets up and leaves because it's really hot. But um, thank you so much for joining us for this session. Uh, I'm Natalie Pennyfather. I'm the Director of Lands, Environment and Economic Development with Indigenous Services Canada Ontario Region. Uh, happy to host you today. Uh, we've also invited to talk um, to you today about programming and funding opportunities. Friends of ours from the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario and FEDNOR. So we've got Joelle LaFrance from uh, Fed Deb and Ron Begin from Fed Noor, and then we've also got our own Brandy Oliveira, who's our manager of economic development. So um, we, we're just going to have everyone run through some presentations, but if in the midst of that you're inspired to ask a question, uh, please don't hold back. So we want it to be as interactive uh, as, as possible. Okay, so with that, Michelle? Very good, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Annie, bonjour. Hello, uh, bonjour. Je vois la France. I'm a manager of economic development at uh, the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario. It's a mouthful, so we go by FedDev Ontario more often than not. Um, very happy to be invited to speak to uh, folks uh, here today at the uh, joint gathering this year. Um, I attended virtually last year and uh, had made notes uh, to some of our uh, folks within the agency thinking that this was the right place to come and, and speak to some of our uh, funding programs. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, just to build on the land acknowledgement that was made this morning, I'll just acknowledge I'm from the Peterborough region and so the, the land that I, um, that I reside on is the territory of the Mississauga, Anishinaabek, specifically Curve Lake, First Nation and Hiawatha uh, First Nation. Also want to just uh, highlight that we also have Sherry Dockstader, who's an economic development officer, has just joined us, so very pleased to have her with us in the room. Um, the intent here is just to give you a quick overview of some of our funding programs, some of the changes that have occurred at FedDev Ontario recently, um, and then maybe 10 minutes, then Ron will present, and then hopefully we'll have Q&A after Brandy's presented. Two apologies. Um, to answer any questions specific to maybe some of the projects that you have uh, going on uh, within your community. So quickly in terms of, uh, of an overview, uh, we'll talk about the agency. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, funding ecosystem that we have supported in Southern Ontario and then talk about some of those funding opportunities as well. Uh, FedDev Ontario is about 14 years old, brand, uh, relatively new agency, and we're here to advance and diversify the Southern Ontario economy through various funding opportunities. We have four main roles that we, uh, that, um, that we deliver on. So the co-investor role, we can come with dollars and cents for some of these projects. We have a convener role, so we can make uh, and facilitate some of those connections with other organizations that perhaps we funded or other parts of the federal family. We also play a champion role, so specifically around you know, certain uh, sectors, uh, uh, particular issues that are important to Southern Ontario. And then we can also play a pathfinder role. So if you call and we're not the right department, we can often you know, identify another organization that may be uh, able to provide you some of the support that you're looking for. So quickly, one of the things that's important to note is, uh, unfortunately, I suppose to a certain degree, uh, Ontario is split up in two with the regional development agencies. FedDev Ontario covers Southern Ontario only, and so the 37 census divisions that you see here on the map uh, make up our, um, our, our area of service. Everything else outside of that will fall to FedNor um, in Ontario. Um, so talking about the Indigenous uh, funding ecosystem that we have uh, supported or we support. So in terms of startups, um, we, have, we provide operating support to the Indigenous financial institutions in Southern Ontario, or at least two of them. So we have the Two Rivers, I always mix up, CDC Community Development Corp, and then we have Tecumseh, I think, Community Centre Development uh, uh, Corporation. We provide operating funding. They provide loans to small businesses um, who are looking to um, often to, to start up, sometimes to expand and provide another host uh, or a host of other programs that may be um, um, 
that the federal government may be looking to deliver, uh, as well as the, the province. And so while we only support uh, financially the two that I've mentioned in southwestern Ontario, and I can show you the map in, in a moment, um, they do also deliver other programming. So it's often worth giving them a call. In terms of moving into that mid-market, those growth companies, so you're looking at that first level of growth, um, we have uh, helped to create a couple of funds. So we have the SOFI Fund, so Southern Ontario a Fund for Investment in Innovation. So these are not always tech companies, but innovative companies who are looking to grow. We also, five years ago, um, helped uh, create Aboriginal Impact Capital. And this is a joint venture between the four Indigenous financial institutions in Ontario. So this includes the Métis Voyager Development Fund, the Indian Agricultural Program of Ontario, IAPO, and then the two other Indigenous financial institutions that I mentioned earlier. This Aboriginal Impact Capital Fund is for these mid-sized uh, mid businesses in Southern Ontario only. Um, and um, it is, this organization is managed by the four uh, Indigenous financial institutions, so all decisions are being made um, by, you know, indigenous, uh, um, uh, indigenous employees for these, uh, these institutions. And then we also have Fed of Ontario. We can do funding on our own, um, and often um, we can be that standalone in terms of those growth companies. We're not be honest with you, we're not there for the startups. Again, we provide support to other organizations to do that. We are really there to support some of those growth companies um, as well. Next, when I talk about the Indigenous financial institutions, um, uh, we also talk about the Community Futures Development uh, Corporations and the Community Futures Program. We have in Southern Ontario 36 independent not-for-profit organizations. As I mentioned, two of those are uh, Indigenous uh, uh, focused. Um, with Two Rivers and Tecumseh. They're all volunteer boards of directors and they have staff that then uh, report to the board and do all of the, the hard work. I will note that while uh, it's hard to see on the map, the two Indigenous financial institutions are in south southwest southwestern Ontario. Uh, the Community Futures Development Corporations in eastern Ontario have also um, a role to play and the First Nations within those areas are within their catchment areas and they can provide service. Just a, a quick spotlight on the two Indigenous financial institutions that we do support. So there's Tecumseh. Um, they serve 10 unique First Nations in their area. Um, and I won't list them all, but they are there. They are you know, a different organization than they are uh, for Two Rivers, where they um, really focus on two communities that are nearby. Tecumseh has a wide geography and provides services across the board. Uh, one of their success stories being Big Soul Production. So they started with a small loan from the Community Futures, and that that snowballed into some larger contributions that have allowed them to uh, get to a place where they're producing $2.5 million in terms of leverage partnerships and agreements. One of the other success stories recently for Tecumseh is they've also created a First Nations marketplace to allow some of those, um, uh, well, the, not, uh, some of those makers to allow, it, allow them to sell online without having to create their own stores. And so they're trying to provide access to the market uh, for th some of those smaller uh, producers. Then we have Two Rivers Community Development Corporation. They service Six Nations and Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, again, they were the lead in creating Aboriginal impact capital uh, and really driving that uh, home. And they've also played a role uh, in their community in terms of high-speed internet a few years ago in trying to, to do that. They've also played a role in, in terms of other success stories in the battery storage plant um, that was recently announced in the last year. Um, and they've also recently launched a free uh, digital toolbox that is uh, run by AI to support small businesses with you know, marketing, uh, outreach, and the like. So certainly encourage you to go and take a look at their website for that. In terms of FedDev Ontario's co contributions to uh, Indigenous-led and Indigenous-focused projects, so since 2015, the agency has invested more than $75 million to support 240 Indigenous-led projects and Indigenous-focused projects. And recently, coming out of the pandemic, we, uh, we provided $3.5 million to Indigenous Tourism Ontario to help deliver some of those uh, smaller tourism-type projects uh, under the Tourism Relief Fund. So as you can see there, 
um, you know, six not-for-profit organizations were able to get $600,000, and 17 for-profit businesses were able to, uh, to receive up uh, $1.4 million to move some of their uh, projects forward. One of those success stories uh, just recently, so if you're thinking, you know, can this happen to us, of course, um, uh, Moonlight on the Bay, uh, they received up to $100,000 to help uh, develop their, um, their tourism offer. And so they provided, they took the, the dollars that were provided to help create two cabins to, to uh, expand their service offer uh, out uh, in Mohawks Bay, Quinty uh, area. And so they were, um, they were great to work with and they were very thankful for, for the support that they, uh, they received from us. And also the, they were wonderful in, in highlighting the, the, the level of service they felt that they got from one of our officers. So they, they were a, a big success story for us under the Tourism Relief Fund. Another one in terms of supporting makers um, is uh, Biscani, and I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly. Um, this was through another one of our programs where the um, Macqua Media and Biscani Inc. receiving up to half a million dollars to continue to build out an online platform um, to support Indigenous uh, creators um, of uh, goods. And so the whole intent here is to provide as much money to the uh, to the creator uh, t um, as possible. And so that was, uh, that was very recently. We announced this, I think, um, late summer. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing the good work that's going to come out of this project. Um, another big change for us uh, recently was the launch of our Indigenous landing page. And so we had been hearing through, um, I guess, certain uh, engagements that sometimes government is a little uh, complicated to kind of figure out. And one of the things that we did was launch this landing page. It is not, it is not a new pro program with separate dollars. It is a new service where ultimately you go to the website, there's a phone number, there's an email. You don't have to read all of our program guidelines. You can just call us and say, I have an idea, can you help me? And then someone like myself, someone like Sherry, we have another member of the team, will book a call and kind of work it out with you to see if we're the right agency or if we can play a convener role uh, and direct you to someone else who might be able to, um, to support you. Further, just recently in September, we launched a new streamlined application process to try to better uh, serve Southern Ontarians. And I want to highlight this because it does uh, change for Indigenous businesses a little bit. If you go to the website, um, you'll see that the application um, form is no longer available because we're on this new timed intake uh, process. However, um, intake for Indigenous businesses and Indigenous uh, applicants does not exist. You can apply at any time. We have two simplified streams. So when you're applying, you really have to answer one, one basic question before we can start talking. Are you for profit or are you a not for profit organization looking to help businesses grow? We have one set of parameters, where we used to have many, now there's one set of parameters, program, uh, project size. Project size minimum is $125,000, and then we can go up to $10 million in, uh, in terms of support. Who is eligible? A um, lot of flexibility here. So businesses and entrepreneurs, not-for-profit organizations and associations, indigenous economic development corporations um, that may be either uh, at arm's length of your communities, and then other Indigenous uh, organizations uh, that may be uh, Indigenous owned. So if you have a band uh, owned business, also eligible to apply. Types of activities that we fund, you can see them there, but for profit, we're talking about uh, production capacity, developing new products, access to uh, services and expertise, uh, growing your market, so participating in trade shows and the like. And then for not for profits, we're looking to uh, provide support to Indigenous businesses for access to capital, networking, mentoring opportunities, enabling participation in growing sectors. So if we're talking about EVs in Southern Ontario and battery storage, uh, uh, yep, uh, battery uh, uh, storage uh, type projects, looking at developing and supporting a skilled workforce and increasing technical capacity. This, this past um, uh, timed intake quarter, we had, uh, we had intake priorities that included clean economic growth, uh, supporting growth companies, uh, technology and then moving uh, and supporting businesses with industrial transition. Uh, one of the last success stories that we have, or the last one I have in the presentation, is around eSupply Canada. This is another Indigenous-led uh, uh, owned business. 
that was successful in receiving up to $1.1 million from FedEv Ontario to help build uh, on uh, their current business and, and start developing a larger platform to allow them to, um, to, to uh, expand their distribution platform for uh, as a janitorial, small-scale industrial supplies. And so that's a big deal. That's a, another project that was announced this summer. So we're very excited to see where this project will, uh, will lead. And that's all I have here for today before I leave things uh, off for my colleague at FedNOR. I will suggest um, that um, you know, the website is something to consult. The email is always um, being looked after. I have cards here as well if you'd like to talk afterwards. Um, but uh, the email there is great because if I'm on holidays, I won't answer you. But someone will take a look at that email and get back to you faster than I would. And that's all I have to, uh, to offer here today. Ron? Oops. Uh, just a quick mention that all of the presentations of it, uh, that are being provided today in this session will also be available through the Southern First Nations Secretariat website, through the event um, QR code that's widely distributed. Good afternoon, Andy Bonjour. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about all things FedNOR. Um, FedNOR is the economic development arm of the Government of Canada for Northern Ontario and I'd like to sort of define the area going in. We start on, on this side of the, uh, on the other side of the Severn River. So we take in uh, Muskoka, uh, certainly North Bay, Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, Timmins <clears throat> and all the way to the Manitoba border. So quite a huge area. We're about uh, 10% of the population, but we cover about 90% of the land mass, so a huge area to, to provide services for. I guess the big news is FedNOR is finally a standalone agency. Prior to that, since 1987, we've been a program of the Government of Canada through uh, uh, several agencies, most recently ISAID. But currently we're a standalone agency, similar to FedDev, ACOA in the east, and certainly WD to the, to the west and DEC in Quebec. We have offices in our all five major cities and we also have representation in Kenora and we have certainly staff and representation in Ottawa looking after our needs. We are divided into uh, three areas, Northeast, Northwest and North Central. Me personally, I work at the North Bay office and I, li and I live in Sturgeon Falls, which is in West Nipissing. And uh, we live next door, to put in perspective, next door to Nipissing First Nation. And over the, having lived in, in Sturgeon Falls for the, the last close to 40 years, I've had uh, many opportunities to play ball and hockey against the, uh, the boys from Nipissing. Uh, Nipissing Warriors is a fine hockey club and, and certainly uh, have had many great teams over the years. And speaking of teams, I'd like to maybe introduce you to the Fednor team. We are pleased to have uh, the Honourable Patty Haidu as our Minister for FedNOR, and she's also the Minister for ISC. It's very nice to have a, someone who lives in the North making decisions for Northerners um, uh, within the, the funding framework that, uh, that, that she is, is in charge of. Our, our President is Valerie Gideon, and she's from Ottawa and has a lot of experience with, um, with Indigenous projects. Our Vice President is Nick Fabiano, um, he is essentially grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, so he certainly has lots of, of, of roots if, in Northern Ontario. Those are the three that represent us in Ottawa in terms of ensuring our needs are met in the capital region. Someone you probably want to meet if you're from the North is our Executive Director. She has certainly risen through the ranks over the years and is currently our Executive Director uh, since FedNOR has become a standalone agency. Her name is Lucy Perrault. Uh, I believe she's trying to make here tomorrow. If not, I find that whenever she just does travel the north, she goes all of her way to, to meet communities, to meet businesses, and really find to see what makes them tick. Um, if you go down to the box on the left, then that's where you'll find me. I'm uh, known as a, an initiatives officer. Uh, I like to think that I'm the uh, boots on the ground or the guy in the ice. So I'm the kind of person that wants to meet you. 
I want to talk about uh, what makes you tick, what your dreams are, and uh, what you hope to accomplish for your communities or for your business. I think uh, that kind of discussion could learn to uh, could lead to uh, the need for for a feasibility study or a business plan or a community consultation. That eventually leads then to the possibility of having a project, and uh, from there we could bring the to bear the other funders that may want to be a partner with and what you, what you want to accomplish. And I think you'll get, you'll get some great things happening from there. As far as federal investments, I think for 22-23, along with the other years prior to the years during the pandemic, a, sig a significant amount of investment, our core budget usually around the $45 million range, but you can see from here, uh, we did spend uh, or put into the communities and businesses, First Nations, non-for-profits, about $118 million. This represented about 608 projects. But if you recall during the pandemic, there was a lot of money going out the door to ensure that communities and businesses had the resources required to start to stay afloat. I can talk about aerospace, airports, jobs and growth, Triple uh, RRF, regional relief and recovery for, for businesses that needed the assistance. Some of the communities may have taken advantage of the, Canada, of the CCRF, which is the Canada Community Revitalization Program, where there's a lot of projects that were basic community-based that allowed, allowed the communities to benefit from. And last of all was the Tourism Relief Fund. Tourism was hard hit during those years of the pandemic, and there was a need for, for opportunities to, to assist them to make sure they can stay afloat. When federal puts their, their, their budgets together and their planning, there's a number of lenses that they put uh, in front of what they want to accomplish. In terms of economic reconciliation, we certainly want the First Nation co communities to, partic to participate in a meaningful way in terms of the contributions and the service that we provide. We're very conscious of the fact there's over 150 small communities in Northern Ontario, many of which have populations of under 2,000 2, people. So uh, we need no to know we've got to do better outreach to ensure they understand who we are and what we can do for them. Uh, in terms of being inclusive in what we accomplish, I cite the uh, Black Entrepreneurship Program, where Federal played a role in working with the Black community, uh, focusing on needs for uh, minority communities, women, youth, uh, certainly newcomers, and LGBTQ. As far as specialty sectors, that or specialty sectoral sectors, we certainly know that the critical minerals is a, a hot commodity uh, dis discussion at the present time. We're working hard to, meet, to ensure that the natural resources we have, that we can include you know, certain minerals like lithium, cobalt, and nickel, uh, can be extracted so we could be part of that sort of booming economy that we see on the horizon as we move towards uh, electrically propelled vehicles. Our, our main focus is business growth and expansion. We want businesses to thrive. We want them to be successful. I want them to, to grow and provide employment and contribute to the economy of our, of our communities. Always concerned, hard to find labor. It's, it's like that all over. So skilled workforce is looking for sustainable jobs in the north. And, as, and we're also looking at the digital clean, clean technologies to make sure that we can take advantage of the latest technology to benefit our communities. All of this is done in collaboration with other funding partners. Fender is a small player when you talk about, we talk about the $45 million, million in all that we do. Um, I want to certainly give credit to the province with the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, which is a special program offered uh, by the province for communities and, and partners in Northern Ontario in excess of $100 million a year that's available for businesses, communities, First Nations and non-for-profits. So certainly applaud to them. But we also bring in ISK. I can talk about other programs, uh, projects we've been involved with where we had either Trillium at the table, ISK, Indigenous Services Canada, uh, the National Research Council, uh, tourism agencies, and I can go on. But certainly looking for funding partners and I would certainly employ you that if you have a project that you exhaust all opportunities that you only put in your money last and get the benefit you can from what government and, and private sector may have to offer you. In terms of talking directly about our programs, uh, the first one we refer to as REGI, or it's Regional Economic Growth Through Innovation. There are two parts of that business scale up. My understanding of that and my experience with the particular program is dealing with a lot of uh, businesses that are involved in manufacturing. They're the ones that we talk about quality control, something, equipment that's new to them, latest technology that allows them to compete on the world stage, allows for enhanced uh, productivity, looks at quality control, looks at volume output, and it leads to more profitability. It's not about always job creation. Sometimes it's taking uh, individuals that have 
sort of more manual jobs, retooling them on, on the, the latest technology to ensure that they have a higher paying job, but they're more productive and more job satisfaction associated with dealing with that. The other part is, is funding ecosystems. Fedner does fund a, a fair amount of ecosystems that allows organizations to represent us in terms of their needs. I, I can use, uh, give you a, slight, you a few examples. Paro that deals with uh, women in business and, and the needs of, of growth of uh, growth and uh, sustainability for them. Our innovation cl clusters, uh, Innovation Initiatives Ontario North and or NORCAT in, in, in Sudbury and there are many others. Uh, Blue Sky Economic Development Growth Corporation who represents us in terms of fostering the need for em enhanced broadband and adoption of technology. And last one would be Woodworks, there are others, but Woodworks where they work with the forestry sector to ensure that they too are using the latest technology and, and because of, of the amount of wood we have in, in uh, northern Ontario that that particular fiber and that product is used to a maximum to, to return on, on our companies that work in the forestry sector. The other program is, uh, which, I which, which I think would be the sort of the nearest and dearest to uh, municipalities, First Nations and non-for-profits, is the Northern Ontario Development Program. Um, I've arbitrarily selected the seven or eight projects. I don't have them uh, in a slide format, but we'll be better next year in terms of trying to describe them to you. But the first one would be um, some that I deal with or some that are near in the Northeastern Ontario would be sort of a maple syrup. Uh, production for a First Nation that I deal with in uh, Northeastern Ontario in the Parry Sound area. They have a long history of producing maple syrup and maple products uh, for market. They know they have uh, uh, real good opportunities for enhanced productivity and in dealing with ISC and Northern Ontario Heritage from the province, uh, we've approved nearly a two million dollar project which will give them uh, expansions to their existing operations, a new building, commercial kitchen, enhanced uh, tapping, that'll make them one of the larger producers of, of maple syrup in Ontario. And I think that's a real positive thing. Um, the other one is, is uh, an organization called Schwimikon. It's a partnership between th three First Nations that have, created, ha that have created a construction company. And as such, they wish to hire from within their three First Nations. And that may be a, a situation and they partner with the private sector which sort of leads the way with them. But trying to find um, employees at the time may be challenging, but you've got a, a lot of young people or individuals that say, if I had the skills, certainly would want a hand on. So Fedner's involvement at that time was to actually pay for uh, a, a training coordinator that would look at the needs of training for First Nations across Northern Ontario, and then work with Confederation College out of Thunder Bay through uh, for MTCU to ensure that the resources are in place, that, that the skill developed can be with the ones that, that want to be here. We have a population that growth, which is young First Nations who aren't going anywhere. They want to be here and they want, want to contribute. So a real opportunity for that training to take place. And the last thing in terms of speaking with them was a few years ago, they had a, a, a database of over 300 individuals that were looking for meaningful training that would allow them to, to participate in the construction sectors, you know, carpenters, welders, uh, AZ drivers, that sort of thing. So Fedner played a role in that. We don't do direct training, but certainly that we found a way to be a partner of that particular project. The other one, other First Nation, and this is again near where, the, where this particular company is, is we help them open a rock quarry. So the idea of uh, blasting, putting in a base, bringing in the, the equipment to the, the, do their initial base to create, you know, granular A, granular B. So this company then it kind of buys, one First Nation group buys from another First Nation group, which contributes to the overall economy. You know, working on roads, putting in culverts, and they received in, in Sault Ste. Marie a nice highway project from the province uh, in the, in the Garden, Garden River area. So that was a, a real, real plus. Food production in terms of um, food safety or growing from the north instead of getting your romaine lettuce from California. Uh, you may have heard of a lot of units right now that uh, this is more of a brand name. It's called grocer units. But what they do is take advantage of LED lights and aquaponics. And you can actually grow all sorts of greens, vegetables, 12 months of the year and sell within your community. It's, it's good food. It's on site. And again, it creates, it creates employment and certainly provides service that much needed in terms of food, of food security. The, another one would be the creation of an industrial park. We, we're not about to do build it, they will come, but if you ever had a uh, business that we would like to sort of, sort of open in your area or near your area and you indicated if they only had a road 
or you talk about infrastructure, whether it be uh, you know, sewer, water, gas, uh, three-phase power, that sort of thing. That's the kind of discussion you can have with government to ensure that we provide the services to the lot line and then the return on that would be sort of a building, a business, and jobs and employment for the area. And you could add to the, the, the taxation as well. Um, another one is a roof on an outdoor rink. You might think we talk about economic development, but a roof on an outdoor rink in a First Nation, uh, we tell them, put the economic spin on that because you'd think that would be sort of recreational, and it is. But from our discussions, um, we talk about the opportunities that a, 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 a center, a, a gathering area in a center of a community brings, brings to you. It's covered, it's, it's enclosed, and from that, that could lead to tourism opportunities for uh, powwows, or you could be looking at uh, uh, a farmer's market. So you've got the tourism element, you've got the commerce element, uh, hockey tournaments, recreational in nature, but still it brings people, moves people around, makes them spend money, uh, stays in the area. So that kind of stuff is, is the angle you put. So Federal will be interested in creating that particular center and we're positive uh, we're involved with that. From an employment perspective, uh, youth internships, we do fund youth internships. Uh, it's kind of 30 years old and be below. Recent graduates, if you had somebody that wanted to come back to your community and, and be employed in the economic development field in a meaningful way, we would pay 90% of the wages for a whole year, up to $35,000. So it's not, a, it's not a, if they're living at home, it's not a bad wage to start out. And uh, the, the key to the program is that they, they gain experience, they get the chance to network. Hopefully they, they can then work, work their way up through the, uh, through the em employment system and contribute to uh, you know, attract youth, keep youth in the North because our population uh, is just hanging in there. We need more people. Uh, the, um, the immigration program is trying to address some of those issues, but I, I would you know, render to say that the growing population of First Nations is another way that we should take advantage of to ensure that we stay strong in the North. The, uh, the last one is a CENO project it's called Community Initiatives, uh, in Investment Initiatives for Northern Ontario. This is something we started a few years ago where often you have a First Nation or municipality that has an idea regarding an economic development project. They may have just completed a strategic plan, they want to sort of implement stuff, but they haven't got the staffing that's required to make it happen. FedNOR um, has come up with this program a few years ago, and it pays 90% funding, up to probably $400,000 over a period of three years. So you're gonna need to go for three years, paid at 90%. We take care of wages, benefits, travel, and training and it's a pretty good return on investment. And you, as, as the proponent, have an opportunity to have a body in place that can be that network, network person for individuals wanting to set up in the First Nation and move forward. And the last one I think uh, uh, Joel talked about it is the Community Futures Program. There are 24 in Northern Ontario, and the lines of business they talk, access to capital in terms of, of, uh, of investing in their business. We were talking about business support services, they're also responsible for community economic devel development on, on a regional basis. And of course, they're very much working with communities to do strategic economic development planning. And I believe the ones in Northern Ontario, I think Wabatech, Nishinaabe, uh, ASCII, and uh, Wakanagan are the CFDCs that have more of a, a lens towards First Nations. And my last file is a few years ago, FedNOR did undertake a prosperity and growth strategy. And that was, uh, I'm not going to go through all the detail, but talk about our priorities. So we want to support innovation, doing things better, doing things smarter, you know, getting equipment, better ecosystems, uh, growing companies. We know that the better chance of growing companies are expanding from the ones that are currently there as far as, as having them succeed as opposed to outright attracting new ones. And building stronger communities, and that's important. We have a lot of communities, uh, sparse in nature. A lot of challenge getting to all of them, doing a lot of things. Infrastructure is expensive, but that certainly is a priority for us as, as well as we go forward. Keep in mind, whenever you do your, your applications, you always want to tie it back to either the, the strategies that we talked about. How does it, how does it you know, uh, link to the priorities that the Government of Canada has regarding the programs that we have? Um, uh, I, I would like to say also in closing is that don't worry about reading forms and what we do, and I think Joel highlighted it quite properly, is tell me your ideas, tell me what you want to do, Le leave it to us to find out how it fits or how it can fit. If we can't do it, let's get somebody else in, in place that maybe it's somebody else's priority. That'd be it for now. Thank you very much.
think I'll just say ditto. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Okay, everyone. I'm Brandy Oliveira. I'm uh, with Ontario Region's Economic Development Unit, and I'm happy to provide you what I hope will be a very quick presentation today. Um, let's see, full screen, there we are. So the lands and economic development programs that are available through Indigenous Services Canada, Ontario region are not really new. They've been around for at least, uh, in, in various versions for at least uh, two decades now. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned here, I'm going to provide a quick overview of those uh, programs and we likely won't get into uh, the rest, uh, just simply due to time. Um, so our funding programs basically boil down to two um, programs. One's called the Lands and Economic Development uh, Services Program, also known as LEDSPI, and we have two components within it. And then we have the Community Opportunity Readiness Program, CORP, and again, two components within that program. Uh, LEDSBE CORE is uh, basically the funding that's received by the community um, and is usually used to support the role of the EDO in a community or in instances where the community receives CORE funding for lands. Um, it's also the same program that supports the core funding for the land managers or the staff in lands and economic development uh, at the community level. So now, uh, so we have the core, right? And now we have a targeted component to that. So the individual often needs tools to be able to do their job effectively. And so the targeted per uh, portion of the program is intended to provide support for those tools. So if it's an individual and, and a need for training, uh, capacity building, a plan, um, uh, other stuff like that, that's where we use our Let's Be Targeted program um, to, to support those types of activities. And um, unlike the core, the core is something that's built into your funding agreement annually. It's not something we require any application for. Um, it's based on a historical allocation, but the Let's Be Target is something that does require an application. Um, some activities that are eligible under Let's Be Targeted include, as I mentioned, some capacity building. We tend to get applications, be it from um, organizations like the Ontario First Nations Economic Developers Association, or uh, on, on rare occasions, sometimes tribal councils or PTOs that are looking to provide a specific event or a specific initiative to build capacity for their affiliated communities, we will provide support for those events. Um, as well, this is the program that supports activities that lead to uh, ideally successful, uh, shorter time framed uh, ATRs, I ideally. I know it's not always the case. Um, uh, and, and often uh, we're able to do that with the, um, because the, we see it and the federal government sees this, the connection between additions to reserve and economic opportunities that arise as a result of those ATRs. Um, this program is also available to support any compliance activities that are um, associated with land designation processes and the processing of land administrative instruments such as leases and permits. So activities that are required to take place for those to be successful, this program can support those activities. Uh, enhanced environmental awareness initiatives within a community or within a group of communities are, are eligible for support through this program, as well as pol pollution prevention on reserve. Um, some communities have used it for recycling programs and things of that nature. And finally, environmental management best practices uh, within um, uh, the land and community assets on reserve. 
So that's, that's sort of the core and, and what the core sort of needs to do their job. Now, uh, the Community Opportunity Readiness Program, it's, it's just economic development. It's not as much lands and environment at this point. And this is a community has a specific opportunity um, or they're interested in pursuing a specific opportunity and they want um, to uh, do any sort of due diligence work associated with that, maybe complete a feasibility study, do some design work on an economic opportunity that they see on their horizon. Well, this is the program that's going to support you to take those early steps to either acquire, start, or expand a business. Um, as uh, and, and I should have stated that this program is specific to community-owned businesses. This program's not uh, available for individuals applying for business opportunities. Our programming uh, within ISC is community-based. The individual business opportunity support uh, it, from us is available through the Aboriginal financial institutions, such as Wabatek and uh, Anishinaabeaski Development Fund. So if you're calling us, if you're calling our team, it's because it's a community-owned um, business opportunity. The other, um, the other stream of funding available through CORP is for uh, projects that are looking at economic infrastructure and simply put uh, economic infrastructure in by our programs requirements is uh, a building that ha that houses more than one business so this is really a fancy schmancy way to to tell the story of how our programs all relate to one another you know you you, you are ideally working with a community strategy and you're moving from that strategy into a first phase where you're going to review an opportunity, do some of uh, your due diligence to ensure that you're making the best uh, business um, decisions possible for your community. And then phase two, moving into the actual capitalization of your opportunity, whether it's a business startup acquisition or again, in, uh, 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 building a, a building for economic infrastructure purposes. And in, in each of those areas, we our, our program is available throughout the life cycle of your economic opportunity. We tend to, to be the supporter at the early stages. Our program isn't heavily resourced, so we tend to be the ones that can come out first, be with you, support the feasibility plans, support some of the business plan work, and often we are finding that our partners are the ones that will support more of the capitalization piece. But uh, we, we like to think of ourselves as, a, uh, as your um, support within the government to open some of those doors to other government departments. And um, very recently, uh, Indigenous Services Canada headquarters announced uh, a business navigator tool that they have available. Um, this tool is available through Ottawa, as I mentioned, and uh, that's the email there. Um, if, if ever somebody is, is looking for information and, and looking for a gateway into the federal government, it is intended that this business navigator would be um, a tool for you to use to get uh, the information that you need from the federal government as a whole. Um, but I think we're all taking that role more um, in the last five years at the federal level, more and more, to, to all take a part in, in supporting pathfinding to the best of our ability. Ideally, nobody's getting the, I can't help you and I don't know where you're supposed to go from here. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't hope that from us. Um, so finally, this is uh, my contact information. It's all uh, right below my email there is a generic email for the team here in Ontario region. And it's, as, as is the case everywhere, it's manned by the entire, many teammates. So um, if, for, you know, if you're looking for a quick response, I would, I would recommend LED Ontario. And uh, that's, that's some of the team members that, uh, that I have the great pleasure of working with every day. Um, so uh, not just for me, are, are there any questions for anybody uh, in the room?
well, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to just really quickly, since we didn't get a chance, um, earlier today to talk about some of our successes and some of our success stories. I'm just going to share that in 2022-2023, Ontario Region supported 69 projects through the programs that I talked about today, not including the core. The core is uh, approximately 13 million in itself, but 11, uh, 11 and a half million uh, went to 69 proposal-based projects in Ontario region and we're well on our way to supporting that same number if not more this year. Uh, the honourable mentions, I mean there's so many, but um, there is the uh, Bineshi Business Park at Nipissing First Nation. Um, Attawapiskat LP um, acquired a business in Timmins um, named Gord's Rental if anyone's familiar with the Timmins area and we were so um, excited to be a part of that. Um, we also uh, were a supporter of Indigenous Tourism Ontario and their operations here in the region. Um, and uh, in term, we're starting to kind of find that more and more communities are considering off-reserve housing um, as a potential business opportunity. And that's something we are excited to talk to you about. And, Ideally, communities are learning from one another some of their best practices and ways to consider the commercial aspects of, of housing solutions, perhaps off reserve and sometimes even on reserve. So uh, no idea is too small, no concept is, is too big for us. Um, please give us a call, uh, that's what our team's here for. And, um, we really encourage uh, our teammates to come out to your communities, to meet you where you are, and to then become an advocate for you within the department. Hi. Hi. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I'd, like to have, I'd like to ask a question, make some comments. Sure, that sounds wonderful. I, uh, my name is Stan Beardy. I'm here representing Mishkigogamak. Mishkigogamak is uh, north up there somewhere, so on the 50th parallel. The, the budgets that you just gone through here, is this the same budget, are these same budgets that the department went through at the other room this morning? Or um, as fed, how is Fed nor funded here, is that part of the uh, I, ISC? That's separate. Uh, no, it is the same. You mentioned, I, I remember I was in the room, you mentioned about the economic development budget being yes. one of the lower. So this is a portion of that, yes. Okay, that, that's my question. Yes. Because uh, there, there is... There can, is can, can I just add to that, though? Oh, so, okay, sorry. So, so, I, I, no, I, I got the floor, if you, <laughs> mind, if you don't mind. Yeah. You had yours already, so... No, absolutely. So my, my question is that... Uh, I, I from way up north, and I mentioned in the other room that the infrastructure has been put in place to access the wealth, wealth creation from the far north. You're talking about economic support, small projects. When you talk about wealth creation, we're talking about billions of dollars because I know international investors are all lined up to create that wealth. Going into the future, we'll need a lot more support, not just a conventional Indian affairs or whatever approach mentality, because nothing has ever worked for us. That's why we're so poor today. And you look at around us in the far north, there's a wealth being taken out of our region, and yet we're still struggling with a lot of poverty and adequate uh, basic life, life, uh, life, basic, basic rights, clean drink and water, healthcare, shelter, and all that. We're still struggling with that, and yet everybody else getting rich off us. I think what needs to be looked at is when we talk about going into the future, we need help to to connect with the private sector because there has to be industry accountability as well. Because when you look at your constitution, one, section 125, it talks about that jurisdiction where, where those jurisdictions can access tax bases 
when there's an undertaking near a municipality and yet we cannot do that. We have to begin to look at that. It was okay 50 years ago to be done to us like that. It was okay maybe 20 years ago. Today our young people are getting well educated. My boy is at Western University taking business law and he's just one of them. There's quite a few across Canada. I don't think the duty to consult will happen unless we can see an active role in that wealth creation, unless our people can be part of that. There has to be some mechanisms looked at on the long term to create that economic certainty to make sure what you're talking about, maintaining the quality of life for all Canadians, not only mainstream, but First Nation people too. I mean, it's good what you present. But I think we need to move forward now and be realistic how to begin to address the needs of First Nation people year 2023 and going forward. It has to be. Otherwise, we won't have that economic certainty which all of us take for granted today. It's not going to be there tomorrow because our young people are getting educated. They know their rights. They know what they're entitled to. They can interpret your constitution and they'll find a way how, how, how to play the role, but we need to support the federal government. You got you. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there any other questions or comments? Otherwise, I think all of us are um, going to be around for the next few days. So you're welcome to uh, call us. And I think Joelle would just like to. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. We have a booth next door, uh, Fed Norm and Fed Dev. So if you have a project idea that you'd like to talk to us about, come and find us there. We can find some time to sit with you and, and talk that through. Um, so the other piece I just wanted to mention was around the funding, right? So we were talking about Fed Norm. The Fed Norm money is separate from the ISC annual. Thank you all.